Okay, we've got a gallon of water, uh, DC power supply, a bucket and some rubber gloves, and some battery acid. I've seen horror movies that have started out this way. Alright guys, as you can probably tell from the title of the video today, I'm going to be showing you how I anodize aluminum. And by aluminum, I'm typically referring to the 6061 grade. Um, this is my standard workhorse material that I use for most of my projects. It's pretty easy to find. I think most of the stuff that's sold online is this grade and it's really easy to work with and it anodizes really nicely. This is not the piece that we're going to be using today though. I'm just showing you an example. Um, so, as I mentioned before, this is not going to be an instructional video. I'm not telling you how to do this. This is basically just showing you how I do it. A lot of people have asked me this in the past from some of my other projects. How do I analyze aluminum? So I'm going to show you today. Alright, I won't bore you too much with the safety gear speech, but as usual, these are some of the things that I always use. I always make sure to have a good pair of gloves that are meant for working with acids. Um, obviously a pair of goggles to cover my eyes to make sure that none of it gets in there because I don't want to go blind. And then always making sure that I wear clothes that cover me from head to toe and making sure that they're natural fiber like, you know, jeans that are made of cotton or wool and making sure I wear long sleeve sh shirts and making sure that they're old clothes too that if the acid gets on it, I don't mind throwing them away. Uh, the next thing that I always make sure I have is some baking soda because if any of that acid spills, I want to make sure I have a way to neutralize it really quickly. So I get a big bag of it and I usually go to Sam's and get some or Costco. As you can see, this one's like 13 and a half pounds, which costs about $8 or $10. It's not really much and it's good insurance in case you need to clean up a spill or in case I need to clean up a spill because you're not supposed to be doing this. So the first thing I did is went ahead and picked up some high density polyethylene or HDP buckets and lids from Lowe's. You can get these at Lowe's or Home Depot or basically any big box store. Um, these type of buckets are usually safe for storing sulfuric acid. So the next thing I'm going to need is some distilled water. And the reason we use distilled water in the anodizing process is because it doesn't have any trace elements or minerals in it, unlike tap water, mineral water, or just general drinking water. Um, that'll mess up your parts pretty quickly. So what I'm going to need is about 5 gallons of this because I'm making up an initial acid solution and also because I'm going to be using this quite a bit to clean up parts as we go through the anodizing process. So the next thing needed is a power supply. Since I'm using the low current density approach to anodizing, I need a DC supply that can push out around 3 amps continuously. This particular model is supposed to be adjustable to push out 18 volts and 3 amps continuously. It doesn't, but it does do the job. You can usually find one of these on Amazon for as little as $50. So the next ingredient in this weird recipe is going to be battery acid. And I found this at my local AutoZone after having to convince the clerk that they do in fact actually sell this stuff. So right now this battery acid is at a 35% acid concentration, which is way too high for the LCD method that we're going to use. I'm going to need to take this down a little bit further, so I'm going to mix this 32 ounce container into... 96 ounces of distilled water, which is going to be a 3 to 1 ratio. Um, that should get us to the right um, proportion that I need for doing the anodizing process. At least I hope it will. Alright, first thing guys, we're going to measure out 96 ounces of distilled water. So I'm going to use this little bucket that has some graduated um, marks on there and fill it up to the line and throw that in the bucket. It's exciting, isn't it? Watching someone pour water. Alright, next we're going to get the acid, and notice that I'm not wearing gloves yet, because this is just water. But next step, definitely wear gloves. So I've gone ahead and opened up the acid container, and I'm adding it to the distilled water now. You always want to add your chemical, in this case the acid, to the water to avoid having an exothermic reaction. If that happens, it could fling the acid back in your face, which would really suck. I'm also making sure to wear a face shield. Even though the video is sped up, I'm actually pouring this pretty slowly to give the mixer some time to mix and dissipate some of the heat being generated in the plastic bucket. After I'm done, I usually let this sit for a while for everything to cool back down to room temp as well. So once I've got my acid and water solution in the bucket, um, I go ahead and take a little sharpie and I mark where the water line is. And this is to make sure that if there's any evaporation that occurs in the future, I know how much distilled water to add back. So I'll just add it up to that little mark and I should have the same ratio as I started with. Alright guys, so the solution's about 75 degrees right now. It's still cooling off. Hopefully it gets a little bit cooler. Um, you want to run your anodizing bath at around 70 degrees. 
Uh, that's to make sure that the solution doesn't heat up too much um, because what happens there is you start getting kind of splotchy results on your parts whenever the, it gets beyond I think 80 degrees you start getting some really questionable results. So what sometimes I'll do is I'll actually put this bucket into another container that has some ice in it and some water and that way it'll kind of regulate the temperature. You won't have as much problem if you use a bigger bucket or a larger amount of solution. <clears throat> also if you're in an area that's pretty cool all the time that should be too much of a problem. If you're doing this you know in a really hot climate and you're running the current through this temperatures can rise pretty quickly so just try to keep in mind that it should be around 70 degrees for optimal results. Now the next thing you're going to need is also a cathode. The cathode is just basically <clears throat> the negative connection on here. This will actually go into the solution. The part that you're going to be anodizing is called the anode. You guys probably already know that though. I'm going to go ahead and put this into the mixture right now. So all it is is two pieces of 6061 aluminum that I've screwed together using another 6061 little screw that I made on the lathe. Um, you can also use lead sheet. I prefer to just use aluminum because you know it's not a contaminating metal like lead and it's a little bit easier to find. Um, you can get lead online but I prefer to just use aluminum so you can use either of those for your cathode. Just make sure that it's a pretty substantial piece. It should be larger than your anode. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in and you know we'll go ahead and start prepping the parts for anodizing. So these are some of the parts that we're going to try to anodize today. Um, there's probably one step that you may have noticed that I didn't really miss, I just don't do it, um, and that's called etching. Etching is typically where you use a lye solution to kind of remove the oxide layer off your aluminum parts before you anodize them. I don't do that because first off, I really don't like working with lye. Um, if you've ever seen Fight Club, you'll probably understand what I mean by that. But basically, I don't think there's a need for it. Um, a lot of these parts are machined you know, on my lathe right before I go ahead and degrease them. Um, once I clean them up, I go ahead and submerge them in, I don't know if you can tell, but this is actually a cup of distilled water. So as you can see, they're actually submerged under there. So I'm actually going to go ahead and re-clean these again before I mount them onto these little aluminum um, hanging rods. So this is just a piece of aluminum that you can get on eBay or through like a hobby <clears throat> supply store or I think through Home Depot. Home Depot sells the thinner gauge wire, which is usually this stuff. This will work as well, but you just have to um, bunch it up a few more times. One thing to note here is that you'll always want to make sure that you're connecting your aluminum part to your wire um, in a place where it's going to be inconspicuous. So through that little screw hole would be a good place and then making sure that it's snugly on there because if you're using aluminum wire <clears throat> it's going to anodize and if you move the part around it will not form an electrical contact so make sure that these are kind of jammed in there and it's in a place where you don't want you can't see it um, you can also use titanium wire but that's more expensive and the good thing about titanium wire though is that you can reuse it um, aluminum wire once this goes to the analyzing process it's pretty much one and done unless you go ahead and strip it which you could technically use the lye to do that again but as I said before I don't use lye um, the way I clean these things off is using this um, you can use any degreaser you want I personally like zip fast 505 it's found I found it to work really well I've used it before in the past you always want to make sure that you're wearing gloves when you're doing this process once you put the once you clean these up the first time you'll never want to touch them with your grubby little hands again um, there's oils on there that's going to affect the anodizing process so make sure that you're wearing gloves and then you know not only to protect the part but also to protect yourself from against any of these cleaners that you're using so I'm going to try to pull one of these out, mount it on a wire, and then show you the final degreasing process that I use. Alright, so once you've pulled these parts out, um, what you're going to try to do is fit this little piece, <clears throat> this wire in here. Um, I try to thread it on. This one I can tell is already a little bit loose, so I'm going to fold it over one more time. And you can use pliers to do this. So I like to crimp down the edge and then make sure that the back piece is a little bit thicker so that when you screw it on, it's going to fit in there nicely. So yeah, that's all a lot better.
So that should be nice and secure now. So what I'm gonna do is give it a final <clears throat> spritz of this degreaser. And I'm gonna go ahead and take that over the sink, kind of rub it off. And <clears throat> I'm actually gonna wash it off with a little bit of tap water first. But after that, I go ahead and dunk it into some distilled water again, and that's where it's gonna sit until it goes into the anodizing process. So that's pretty much it, guys. Just go ahead and make sure that your parts are nice and secure on there, that they're not falling off, and that you know, you've know you got good electrical contact, because once that's broken, um, the only way to get fixed this is to go and restrip the part and then go through the anodizing process again, which is a pain. So just make sure you've got a good electrical contact on your wire and make sure that your parts are nice and clean. All right, so here I'm setting up the anodizing bucket in a tray of ice water to try and keep the mixture in the optimal range of 65 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. As I mentioned before, if the mixture starts getting too hot, your parts start coming out with blotches, which is probably not what you want. Uh, you've also probably noticed that I've attached the parts to a single metal rod to keep them at the right depth in the solution, and then connected the positive lead from the power supply, which is the red wire, to those parts. The negative connector, or the black wire in this case, goes to the cathode, which is the big aluminum plate. So as I mentioned before, I'm using the low current density approach for anodizing, which means that you would typically want to apply what's known as the 720 anodizing rule. Uh, basically, this is a formula that uses any known inputs such as the total surface area of the parts, the current density, the desired anodizing layer thickness you want, or time to solve for any of the other parameters. It sounds complicated, but it's not. If you Google 720 rule anodizing calculator, you'll see a few options that'll make you figuring out the math easier, which helps me dial in the settings for the power supply. So I've gone ahead and turned on the power supply, which means that uh, I should start seeing little bubbles forming at each one of the parts. Um, this means that the anodizing process is working, and if you don't see bubbles, means you may have a bad connection. So in this case, I see bubbles coming from each one of the parts, which means I have good connections on all four of these. Also, you should see a lot of bubbles coming out of the cathode. Okay, while well, the parts are anodizing in their little hot tub, let's talk about dyes. Use dyes meant for anodizing, plain and simple. Don't use fabric dyes, markers, all natural organic fruit dyes, or any of that other garbage. They're not meant for color and metal. They may work initially, but will probably fade and give you subpar results long term, which means you'll need to redo your parts, or just live with the shame of having a crappy looking anodizing job. Uh, this bottle that I'm holding is from Caswell and cost me about 10 bucks, and it'll probably last me years as a home hobbyist. You don't have to use this brand, but just make sure it's meant for anodizing. So after a while you'll notice that the bright shiny parts that I put into the anodizing solution um, are now this matte gray color uh, with a little bit of a yellow tinge. Uh, this is pretty normal. It means the anodizing process is working properly and everything is going as planned. So once the time that I've calculated for running these parts has elapsed, I'll go ahead and start pulling them out. So I'm going to pull these out of the anodizing solution and then go ahead and put them in a mixture of baking soda and distilled water to neutralize the acid. And then after they're neutralized, I'm going to just keep wash, rinsing them with distilled water before we go ahead and dye these. So here I'm just checking the temperature of the dye to make sure that it's not too hot. If it's too hot, it'll start sealing the part prematurely and none of the dye will get absorbed into the part. So I usually shoot for about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Caswell usually recommends about 140 degrees, but I like to play it safe and just give it a longer soak. Um, I found that method usually works pretty well for me. So you see the red dye is already leaching in. Blue, not so much. Alright guys, so the last step in this whole process is just sealing these things off. Um, as you can see, there's some dye that leaches into the water, so make sure you do that before you stick them in the boiling water. Now we're going to boil these for about, eh, let's say 30 minutes just to be safe. And that should lock in the color, and then after that we should, we'll be able to polish them.
All right guys, so as you can see, each of the parts are now dyed and should be color stable since I used actual anodizing dye that's meant for this process. Uh, some of the parts came out better than others, but that's mostly due to me being lazy and not fully sanding each of the parts down properly. The two on the left have minor scratch marks that I can still see since I didn't use my traditional 1200 grit sandpaper finish. The two on the right are pretty much perfect for me though since I did actually finish those properly. Um, hopefully you found this useful and it answers some of the questions you had regarding how I anodize parts. If you have any questions, leave a comment and I'll try to answer them. Um, stick around for more randomness. Um, this channel always has a bunch of stuff that's just kind of off the wall. But until then, have a good one. Hmm, I wonder what electric blue tastes like. Tastes like delicious.